G'day everyone and welcome to Laws 11061 Contracts A, Topic 4. This week we're going to be talking about offer and acceptance. Now when it comes to contract formation, offer and acceptance really is where it's at. This is the, uh, the absolute core component of this first part of your study of contracts. Thinking about the last few weeks, we've gotten to the point where we know that our parties have capacity. We know that they're intending to create legal relations. Now we're looking at how they go about actually doing that. If you cannot understand offer and acceptance, then you will struggle really seriously to understand um, anything else that you have to deal with in terms of contracts. This is probably the most important material for the entire course. So I don't think I can stress it any more than that. Um, you really do have to get your head around this stuff. So what are we going to be looking at? The outline for this week, first we're going to talk about the basic concepts of offer and acceptance, what they mean and how they work. We'll talk about the two types of offer, that is unilateral offers and bilateral offers. We'll distinguish between an offer and what's called an invitation to treat. We identify the application of offer and acceptance in some special situations that uh, come up from time to time that really don't fit the normal model of offer and acceptance. Specifically, we talk about contracts that are formed when you accept a ticket from a ticket machine or when you accept a product from a vending machine. And we'll also talk about sales through auction and tender. We'll then look at what happens if somebody has made an offer, but they wish to terminate the offer. How can they do that effectively? We talk about the concept of what's called ad idem, um, which means the meeting of the minds, parties being of one mind, and how that works in terms of our dynamics of offer and acceptance. We look at what the criteria are for the binding acceptance of an offer, and specifically we apply what's called the postal acceptance rule, which is one of those forms of acceptance. Acceptance is important because that moment of acceptance is when we actually have a contract. So let's start with the basics. What is an offer? An offer is a statement by a party with capacity, but we've already talked about the fact that the parties um, need to have capacity in order to form contracts. It's a statement that they're willing to be bound by the terms of that offer. So what is happening when somebody makes an offer is they're saying, I am putting it out there that I am prepared to take on certain obligations, contractual obligations, which you can sue me if I fail to deliver on. I am willing to undertake those obligations on certain conditions. That is the formation of a contract. So I am willing to enter into a contract in order to take on certain obligations. That's the offer. So from a practical perspective, it might be, I am willing to sell you my car for $2,000. That is my offer. Or it might be, I am willing to buy that car, but only for $1,500. That's also an offer. Because the person who makes that offer is saying, I am willing to be bound to be legally obligated to pay that $1,500 to you, but I'm only willing to be obligated to do that if I get your car in return. That's an offer. That means that if you've got something in a problem question or in a real situation which kind of looks like an offer, you have to ask yourself, is the party saying that they are actually willing to be bound by the terms of the offer? You see an expression of interest or um, as we'll see the display of goods, anything that is short of saying, I am hereby willing to be bound at law, anything short of that is not going to be an offer for the purpose of contract law. There's two types of offers. We call them unilateral offers and bilateral offers. Bilateral offers are generally the most common. They're certainly the most common in terms of the undergraduate study of contract law, that's for sure. 
Bilateral offers are made on either a one-on-one -on -one basis or a one-on-few basis. So a, a bilateral, the typical sort of standard bilateral offer will be where there's two parties and they're making a deal with one another. So you have one person making the offer, another person responding to that offer with acceptance in the end, and that's how you form a contract. Sometimes bilateral offers might be made to a uh, one on a few basis where um, you might have somebody making an offer, look, I'm, I'm willing to sell my car for $2,000 to whomever accepts that offer first out of you three people. Okay, so uh, there's an offer that's being made to three different people, but it's still only going to be accepted by one of them. Okay, the person only has one car for sale. Unilateral offers, on the other hand, are a bit different. Unilateral offers are made to the whole world. Anyone can accept them. So if you have something that you wish to, uh, if, you, if you're providing a service, say, let's say you're a dentist, and you're saying, I'm willing to offer a dental examination to anybody who wants one for $50. Well, then that is a unilateral offer because you're not limiting the number of those services that you're willing to perform. Anyone who becomes aware of your offer and who wants to accept it, you're perfectly happy for them to do so. So that's the difference between a bilateral and a unilateral offer. Now there's a lot of stuff out there that looks like offer, but isn't. And I've got to tell you, this is the the law lecturer's favourite way to trip up people who haven't done the reading or haven't adequately done the reading. Because you need to be able to, distinction, uh, to distinguish an offer from these other things that look kind of like offers but are actually not. The first one we're going to talk about is called a mere puff. Mere puff, that's a, <laughs> such a cool um, uh, legal term. A mere puff is an advertising statement clearly not meant to be taken as a literal promise. Have a look at the slide there. We've got a picture of dumplings. I don't know about you, but I love Chinese steamed dumplings. We have um, a steamed dumpling place just near where I work, and I could seriously go in there every day for lunch. Terrific. But this advertising says, Brisbane's best dumplings. Now, if I walk in there and I pay my $6 for, for four dumplings and I get the four dumplings and I eat them and they're good, they're really good, but they're not the best dumplings I've ever had in Brisbane because there were some other dumplings that I've eaten previously that were even more superlative than these ones. Do I have an action in law? Am I able to go to these dumpling suppliers and say, you have breached your contract with me because you offered me Brisbane's best dumplings and you merely provided extraordinarily good ones. Not happy. Well, of course, you wouldn't really be able to mount an action on that basis. What the puff is really saying is not, these are Brisbane's best dumplings. What the puff is saying is, we think these are pretty good. In fact, we think it's entirely conceivable that these could be Brisbane's best dumplings. As adults within a reasonably sensible commercial world, we understand that advertising that says Brisbane's best dumplings doesn't necessarily mean that by any objective standards these are the best dumplings. We understand that what that is intended to convey to us is that they're pretty darn good. And that, of course, brings us to the carbolic smoke ball case, which I've written about in the notes and which you really ought to learn backwards and forwards and sideways uh, through your study of contracts. Now, in the carbolic smoke ball case, the carbolic smoke ball company has put up an ad that has said, we've deposited money in the bank. If you use our carbolic smoke ball and you still get the flu, you can have £100. Is that a puff? Because the company certainly tried to say it was a puff. They certainly tried to say, look, 
Nobody's really expecting to be paid £100 by our company if they get the flu. Everyone would reasonably understand that this was just a puff, this was just a piece of advertising puffery. Well, the court disagreed. The court said, no, hang on. Because you haven't merely said, you won't get the flu, this, this uh, uh, cure is wonderful. You've actually specifically said, these are the mechanisms that we've put in place to allow you to make a claim upon us if our promise is breached. So what the court said was that in this case, the Carbolic Smokeball Company had gone well beyond merely puffing because they had asserted that the promise they were making, the puff they were making, was supported by scientific evidence and was open to be claimed upon. Most of the time, however, the stuff you read in advertising is going to be a mere puff and the more outrageous it is, the more likely it is to be a mere puff. Next one is invitations to treat. Invitations to treat confuse a lot of people. If you took any average person and walked them into a store and showed them goods on the shelf and said, who's making the offer here? Almost all of them would say, well, the shop's making the offer. The shop's saying, I will sell this product and I'll sell it for this price. In fact, however, it doesn't work that way. Because what the shop's actually doing is called an invitation to treat. An invitation to treat is not an offer. It's a statement that you're willing to accept offers. So an invitation to treat says, I'd love to make a contract. I'd love to make a contract for the sale of certain goods. And if you want to make a contract with me for the sale of those goods, please do drop by and please make me an offer. Let's look at some specific examples. The first one we'll look at is advertising. On the left there we have Don Draper from the TV show Mad Men, brilliant TV show if you've never seen it, that's something to do during the next uh, semester break, standing there with a draft adver advertisement for a magazine that he's putting to the clients. Now when that adver advertisement goes into the magazine, is it an offer? No, it's not. Why is it not an offer? Well, let's go back to thinking about what an offer is. An offer is a statement that the person is willing to be bound. And an offer is something that can then be accepted. Can you accept an advertisement? Or is the advertisement really an enticement to get you to come in and make an offer? What the law says is that the advertisement is merely an enticement. And here's why. Let's say you see an advertisement. It's an advertisement for a product that you want. Maybe it's an advertisement for a product that you didn't even realise you wanted before you saw the advertisement. And you decide, I'm going to get that. The price is right. Everything's good. I'm responding to that advertisement. I'm going to get that product. You get in the car and you head for the nearest retailer. And on the way to the retailer, you start to get a bit of buyer's doubt. You think, you know what, it would be kind of cool to have that product, but when I stop and think about it, I'm not really sure that I need it quite now. I think it would be stretching the budget a bit. Maybe I got a little bit overexcited. You can still turn around and go home. Now, if you can still turn around and go home, that means you're not under a legal obligation. If you're not under a legal obligation, that means there's no contract. If there's no contract, that means you haven't accepted the contract. So if you can make the decision without accepting the contract, that means the advertisement can't have been an offer. Because if the advertisement was an offer and you accepted it, there'd be obligations somewhere. But there aren't. So the advertisement is merely an invitation to treat. The advertisement is saying, come down to our store. Have a look around. We think our products are pretty good. We think you'd like to buy one. If you come down to the store and you would like to buy one, 
grab it, bring it to the counter, and we'll make a deal. Can you see the distinction? There's nothing in any of that statement in the advertisement which actually suggests a readiness on the part of the company to be bound by any obligations of law. So we respond to the advertisement. We head on down to the store. We get to the store and they're selling cakes. Look at those cakes. Absolutely magnificent cakes. Look at all those calories. I want some. I don't care about my trainer. I want some now. I get to the store and I'm trying to choose. The cakes themselves look great. I'm looking at the price list up on the wall. Who's making an offer? Well, strangely enough, the store is not making an offer. Let's think about why. I could pull one of those slices of cake off the shelf, put it in my trolley, wander around with it for half an hour, and then just before I was ready to go to the checkout, I might think, you know what? I don't want that cake after all. I'm going to put it back. I can't even begin to think about how much cardio I'm going to have to do to burn off that many calories, so I'm putting it back. Now, if I can do that, if I can put the product back, that means I was never under an obligation to buy it. If I was never under an obligation to buy it, that means there was never a contract. Which means that my act of taking the cake off the shelf can't have been an acceptance which means there was no offer in the first place. We've got to stop and think, when does the actual legal obligation commence? Well, the legal obligation commences when you get to the checkout and you say, here is the product that I wish to purchase. Because as soon as you've given it to the, the, to the checkout operator and they've accepted it and rung it up, that's when they have an obligation to give you the product and you have an obligation to pay for the product. Now, who's initiated that transaction? Stop and think for a moment. Has the store initiated that transaction? Well, no, they haven't, because all the store did was put the goods on display and hope someone would come along and buy them. It's the buyer who's initiated that transaction, because the buyer could have chosen to stay away from the store. The buyer could have chosen to buy a different product. The buyer could have chosen to walk back out again without buying any products at all. So it makes sense that if the buyer is initiating the, the transaction and if the transaction is not actually binding on anyone until the buyer takes the cake up to the, uh, to the, cake, to the payment counter, well, then it must be the buyer who's making the offer. So remember, advertising and the placement of goods on display, these are not offers. They are just invitations to treat. They're a statement by the retailer that I'm ready to receive offers. I want people to come and make offers to me for my products. Now, if you're not quite following that, please go and have a look at the notes and come back and have a listen again and go through it and through it and through it until you really do understand the difference between offers and invitations to treat because I guarantee you're going to have a hard time with the assignment and the exam um, unless you're able to make that distinction. And we're about to make it all a little bit more complicated. Let's do that right now by talking about ticket and vending machines. Strangely enough, even though walking into a store and taking products off the shelf does not create a contract, taking the ticket from a parking machine or taking a product from a vending machine does create a contract. Now that sounds odd, doesn't it? Why? Why is it that taking a, a ticket or taking a product from a vending machine can actually be an offer? Well, the answer is that it creates legal obligations. The moment you do one of those things, the legal obligation is there. You see, they are the equivalent, not of going through the shop, they are the equivalent of going up to the counter. 
So the ticket machine essentially on behalf of the company says, if you take a ticket from me, then the company will be bound to provide you with parking services and you will be bound to pay for those parking services on exit. You can see that the moment you take that ticket and the boom gate goes up, obligations have been created. So there must have been an offer and you must have accepted it by taking the ticket. Very different to the situation in a store. Same with vending machines. You see, you put your money in, you press the button, the vending machine is obligated to deliver you a product. If the vending machine swallows your money and doesn't deliver you a product, well then that's something that the owner of the vending machine is going to have to correct. You have a means of redress for that. Okay, so in effect what's happening there is that the company, through the vending machine, is making the offer and you're accepting the offer you're accepting the offer by making a payment and taking the product. So that's the concept of an offer. The offer exists when one party or another has gotten to the point where they have said, I am hereby willing to be bound. The moment that this offer is accepted, I accept that I will have legal obligations. So we've got an offer. Can it be withdrawn? Well, yes, it can. Offers can be withdrawn in a number of ways. But the most important thing is an offer can only be withdrawn before it's accepted. So if you put an offer out there to someone and you subsequently regret it and you want to take that offer off the table, you must do so before it's been accepted. Because once it has been accepted, you don't have an offer anymore, you've got a contract. And that contract brings with it obligations. All of this makes sense because you can't really say to someone, I'm making an offer, therefore I'm stating my intention or my willingness to be bound by obligations. And then someone else says, okay, well I'll hold you to those obligations. And then you subsequently say, well, no, hang on, actually, I've changed my mind. I don't want to be bound by those obligations. It doesn't really work that way. So the golden rule for withdrawing an offer is that you have to do it before the offer is accepted. Let's assume now that that's happened or that that's happening. How can we do it? The first thing you can do is uh, withdraw by notice. And this is pretty simple. It just means you have to advise the other party that your offer is no longer open. So I made you an offer to do this in return for that. Uh, I've reconsidered the offer is no longer open. Provided they haven't actually accepted the offer, just making that statement is going to be enough to do away with the offer. It can't be accepted anymore. The second way an offer can be withdrawn is by a counter offer. You see, if I want someone to paint a fence for me and um, I suggest to them that a good price would be $100. And they come back and say, no, actually, um, I would only be prepared to do it for $150. They can't subsequently come back and say, you know what, I'll actually do it for $100 after all. Because when they made the counter offer, when they said, no, actually, I'll do it, but only for $150, that extinguished the original offer. There can only be one offer on the table at any point in time. So if someone makes an offer and the other party makes a counter offer, the counter offer kills off the original offer and so the only offer left on the table is the counter offer. The third way to withdraw an offer is through the expiry of time. This is pretty sensible when you think about it. Quite often in life we will see contractual offers made where someone says um, I've given you a quote for the work and the quote is good for seven days so you have to get back to me within seven days or else the quote will expire so I'm offering to do this work for that price and in order to accept the offer you have to do so within seven days the fourth way is by the expiry of a condition 
Now, for this to work, the condition has to be part of the offer. So let's say I offered to undertake a particular service, uh, but I was only prepared to do that whilst I was in Brisbane and I was planning to leave for Perth on Saturday. And I made an offer that said, if you accept my offer whilst I am still in Brisbane, then I'm prepared to do this, this and this. Now that condition, of course, would expire the moment I got on the plane. So if I had left Brisbane and uh, the offer was subsequently accepted, there would be no contract because the condition in the offer would have already expired. Finally, the death of a party, either the person making the offer or the person receiving the offer. Now this one actually confuses people quite a bit because uh, people want to say, well, no, hang on, if the offer's been put out there, then shouldn't that be binding on the person's estate? And in a way you'd think that, but it really doesn't work that way. Um, because the, the mere fact that there's an offer out there doesn't of itself create legal uh, obligations. Those obligations only come along when there's a contract. So um, if one party has made an offer, they haven't actually accepted any obligations. What they said is, I'm willing to accept obligations. Now, if nobody's accepted that offer and our, our first party goes and carks it, well, then it's pretty unreasonable to say, well, the person has died, but I'm still going to try and initiate a new obligation. Okay, obligations are for the living. Um, as soon as one party or another dies, provided there isn't a contract, the offer dies with them. If, however, there is a contract, if offers have been accepted, then those obligations uh, will often be binding on the estate. So, during that whole spiel about offers, we've let the head a little bit from time to time and spoken a little bit about acceptance um, just in order to make sense of offers. But let's go through now and look at acceptance properly. Acceptance occurs when the two parties are what we call ad idem. Ad idem is Latin for of one mind. So they must be completely in accordance about the terms of the contract. They must be in accordance about the obligations that they have accepted and they must be in accordance about the obligations that the other party has towards them. It must be unconditional. You cannot have a contract where one party is agreeing to one set of obligations and the other party is agreeing to another set of obligations. Acceptance must be communicated. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And finally, acceptance must be in reliance upon the offer. Let's start with this idea of acceptance being unconditional. A few moments ago, we said that an offer, one of the ways to extinguish an offer, is by a counteroffer, because the counteroffer kills off the previous offer and there's only ever one actual offer on the table. Well, what that means, of course, is that while there's this process of offer and counteroffer going on, the parties are not yet ad idem. They have not reached the point where they are of one mind. And so they'll negotiate backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards until they do one of two things. They will either come to a full agreement to be ad idem, or alternatively, they will walk away and not end up uh, with a contract at all. Now, if that happens, if they walk away and they're not, they don't end up with a contract um, at all, then nobody has any obligations, okay? Because it's that moment of acceptance that creates the obligations. So the process of offer and counteroffer is a matter of the parties trying to reach the point where they are ad idem, where they are in full agreement, unconditional agreement, because anything short of that, not a contract. Next thing that's got to happen is acceptance has to be communicated. You cannot accept an offer in the silence of your own heart without telling the other party. And that, of course, makes sense because we can hardly expect parties to uh, respond to obligations 
if they don't actually know that those obligations exist. That makes that makes sense to me. How do we accept? How is it that a party can actually accept an offer? Well, there's a few rules. The first one is that parties cannot accept an offer by silence. Okay, you cannot say, I am making you an offer that I wish to buy um, your home for $55,000. If I don't hear back from you within seven days, I will assume that you're happy to sell me your house for that amount of money. That's a nonsense, okay, because it actually takes some sort of a positive step by the person who's uh, accepting the offer in order to be bound. I dealt with a situation not too long ago um, within my um, uh, Defence Force service where there was concern about whether or not people could be forced to join particular organisations. And the idea was that they were um, part of those organisations by default unless they took steps to withdraw. Now, what do you think? Do you think that that works within contract law? Or do you think that that amounts to st stipulating the communication of acceptance by silence? What do you think that, how do you think that would work if it was in the normal community? What would you say if a gym, say, came along and left a flyer in your mailbox and said, we're inviting you to be part of our gym? Now, our default position is that you are going to be part of the gym unless you get back to us within 30 days and tell us that you don't want to be part of the gym. What do you think? To me, that's acceptance by silence. In fact, it is acceptance by silence. And so the person who he remains silent and does not actually take positive steps to accept uh, the contract, that person has not accepted the contract at all. You cannot stipulate that silence is the means of acceptance of a contract. Second for, uh, rule about communicating acceptance is that parties can communicate acceptance by conduct. Conduct is quite different by silence. So what you can do, you can make an offer to someone and you can say, if you wish to accept this offer, then I need you to do these three things. So for instance, let's say um, I want someone to bring something to me from North Queensland. And I know that they're going to be driving down to Brisbane in the next few days. And I say to them, well, look, I know that you're coming down um, to Brisbane and I would like you to bring these things for me. If you do, I'll pay you $50. Um, please let me know. But they don't let me know. What they actually do is just simply go ahead and bring the stuff down. What do you think? Have they accepted the contract? I mean, they haven't actually communicated with me in words and said, oh, I accept the contract. But they've gone ahead and done the thing that was asked for in the contract. Can you see that that really does amount to communication of acceptance by conduct? They've done the thing that was requested in the contract. Um, and the doing of that thing can be seen to amount to acceptance. We come now to the postal acceptance rule. The postal acceptance rule is a pretty old school um, rule, which we still teach in contract law, uh, partly because of tradition and partly because it's just so interesting. Generally speaking, acceptance is valid at the time that it is communicated because we've already just said that acceptance needs to be communicated, which means until it's actually communicated to the other party, there's no acceptance. What happens with mail, though? Because if I'm accepting a contract by mail, I'll write a letter that says, I accept your contract, I accept your offer, I'll put it in the mail. As far as I'm concerned, I've communicated my response. But it might be two or three days, might be, if it's an overseas letter, it might be weeks before the other party finds out that I've communicated. So in that interim period, is there a contract or not? Well, 
the court has decided that there is a contract, that acceptance takes place the moment the acceptance is actually mailed. Because at that point, the person who is accepting the contract has done everything that they need to do in order to communicate acceptance. Now, look, this really is starting to look a bit old school now, and the postal acceptance rule doesn't apply to instantaneous forms of communication. So it doesn't, for instance, apply to email. It doesn't apply to acceptance of a contract by clicking um, on a website. It only applies to old school snail mail, which used, of course, to be the engine room of commerce, but is now um, much less of a vehicle for business. In most uh, jurisdictions, including in Queensland, there are now specific rules which have been set out in statute uh, for instantaneous communication. And essentially, the instantaneous communication uh, is held to have taken place as soon as um, it is conveyed to the email address that it was supposed to be sent to. There's one final thing to know about acceptance, and that is that the parties can set up whatever form of acceptance they want. So with the postal acceptance rule, for instance, I might make an offer to you, and I might say, when you choose, to, if you choose to accept this offer, please do not mail your acceptance. The postal acceptance rule will not apply to this transaction. Now, if I say that, and you accept that element of my offer, well then, uh, you have to comply with that form of acceptance. If, of course, you don't accept that element of the offer, well, then we won't have a contract anyway because we won't have reached the point of being ad item. So the parties can set out, really, whatever rules they want for the forms of acceptance, except that they can't specify silence as the form of acceptance. So that brings us to the end of what is really a fairly dense um, amount of material what I would have to say is that having listened to this lecture, you've hopefully got a bit of direction with the topic, but this lecture is not enough. Okay, the lectures each week are not enough anyway, but in topic four in particular, the lecture material delivered in about 40 minutes will not be enough. You really must go and read the notes and probably come back and listen to this lecture a couple of times until you thoroughly understand offer and acceptance. If the lecture material uh, plus the textbook, plus these uh, the notes are not enough to get to help you get your head around uh, offer and acceptance. Then you really need to hit me up for a better explanation, because you simply will not be able to successfully study contract law unless you understand offer and acceptance. So that brings us pretty much to the end of the lecture material for this week. We've looked at the concepts of offer and acceptance and why they're so important in contract formation. We've talked about the difference between an offer and a puff or an invitation to treat or a request for information. We've talked about how we can terminate an offer. We've talked about how um, an offer can be accepted. And uh, we've talked, well, we haven't talked about the fact that you'll never be as cool as Don Draper, but we have talked about the importance of having a look at the TV series Mad Men just as soon as you get an opportunity. I hope you've enjoyed the lecture material for this week. Um, I hope that you really uh, enjoy and find useful the notes material for this week. I'll emphasize one last time, please, please, please take the time to get your head around it because uh, this week, this topic material really is the core fundamentals of contract law. Have a great week.